to the seminar. Today, uh, Dr. Emerson Del Ponte will be talking about open data and tools for accessible, transparent, and reproducible research and education in plant pathology. Dr. Emerson Del Ponte received his Doctor of Science degree in plant pathology from the Universidad de Federal de Pelotas in 2004. During his degree, he visited for a year the Bergstrom lab at Cornell University. Later, Dr. Del Ponte worked as a postdoc for two years in the Young Lab at Ohio, at Iowa State University where he was involved in disease risk assessments and prediction. Today, he is a full professor at the Universidad Federal de Visosa, where he teaches plant disease epidemiology, statistical modeling, and data science. As well, he mentors several masters and PhD students. Dr. Del Ponte has or had served as an associate editor in journals such as Plant Disease, European Journal of Plant Pathology, and CAVI Agriculture and Bioscience. Currently, he is the editor-in-chief for Plant Pathology. The, uh, his passion for advocating for an open, reproducible, transparent, and reliable research culture has led him to co-found Open Plant Pathology, and his lab has developed multiple R codes for plant pathology, which has been shared with the community. And thanks, Dr. Del, Del Ponte, for preparing this seminar. We are all excited to learn about your work. Okay. Thank you very much, Mariala, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. I see a lot of people here, some people from Brazil also attending this seminar. <laughs> I advertise on my Instagram, so that's why there are people <laughs> attending from Brazil. Okay, I'm not going to talk about uh, plant pathology or epidemiology specifically, but the idea is to have a conversation about how we can make our research and education more open, transparent, and reproducible as possible using uh, some kinds of uh, tools or changing kind of the philosophy of our work. That's the, the major uh, things I want to address in this, in this talk, in this afternoon. So the idea, what is openness and reproducibility in the context of plant pathology? Why we should be concerned about the right to engage in reproducibility and openness? what is necessary to change the way we do the things to make this, uh, to shift the way we work. And I'm gonna show some examples from my lab in terms of uh, sharing the data and sharing codes to be more reproducible research and also some uh, educational tools that I've been using in my classes. And I know that some other people are benefiting from as, as well. Uh, open and reproducible research, when we talk about open, it's about open access. We tend to focus on opening the article, publishing open access. That's a topic for another seminar if we go on this top open access. The idea is that the more this, the accessibility of the, our research is important for people. And the way the, the journals operate nowadays, it's very expensive to pay for open access for all the papers that we have. So there are some alternatives that I would like to talk about, like the preprint option. And if we talk about reproducible research practices, to reproduce a work, we need the, the data, essentially. We need the data from that work. We need to know the protocols and the codes to reproduce that research. And we call this computational reproducibility. It's the ability to reproduce a work that was done by someone else. That's the idea of computational reproducibility. Uh, the idea of sharing the data and sharing the codes. So uh, when you submit a paper for reviewers, for example, the reviewers can, um, can uh, reproduce that work to check if the work was done correctly, for example. That's one of the ideas. 
when we talk about sharing, documenting, we need to document the data, the protocols and the code to turn this into more reproducible. We have accessibility, replicability, efficiency. We have so many benefits if we turn our routine to something different, but that takes some effort. The way we were taught to do research is that the paper is the most important piece of information. The idea here is to talk about that's much more beyond the paper. That's part of that work. We invest so much time, so long time doing our research, collecting the data, curating the data, organizing, transforming the data, and working in a specific code, a computational code to address a question in our research. That also has value. So the idea is that the reproducible research is something that you can take more benefits out of your research if we, you have the possibility to open the data and the computational codes to other people to reproduce. It's not only important for other people, but yourself in the future. So many times we go back to a computational code and we have no idea what we did. If we don't document that, process well, we are gonna be lost in the field. We are gonna spend so much time. If we work in something that is not documented well or done in a way that's more reproducible, we are gonna take more time to address comments by reviewers, for example, if we need to change the analysis. So documentation is something very important in reproducibility as a whole. So documentation for ourselves and for other people that may be interested in reproducing our research, our work. So that takes an extra effort. Is it worth it? Why is it important? Why should I engage in change the way I organize, document and share openly research data? I think first, we need to uh, make sure that it's okay to share the data. If there's not something that is sensitive, like uh, I know some other errors, like in medicine and in human diseases, you have personal information that you can't share. In some cases, you're not allowed to. But for plant pathology, some kind of research we do, I think that's much more benefits from sharing the data. The, I, when I say sharing the data, I'm talking about the raw data data from experiments, data from the replicates, that the raw data, not the summary data that you show in the, in the paper. I'm talking about the raw data. So that takes time to organize. And actually it's the time that we take if we organize and document our data, that's, that's needed. But why to worry about something that other people can use in the future? So we need to, a good documentation like a software, if you write a software for other people to use, you need to document how to operate that software. If you develop a protocol, you need to document how to operate something, how to, um, how to develop that protocol, how to use a protocol. And the idea is that more and more, some journals are requiring some, uh, not all the journals, but very few journals actually are mandating data sharing that you need to uh, provide your data as a companion to your paper. And most of the, the journals now when we publish, we have the option, we are encouraged to, and to write a statement of data availability. We need to write, what is the statement? Is the data available? Is there a repository where I can get access or it's not accessible? How, what is the, what is the policy? And so according to the Springer Journal, this type three policy, it's not mandatory to share the data, but some journals and more specifically nowadays, some donors and some funders are requiring, are asking researchers in advance when they propose and they write a proposal, you need to have a plan, a data manage, management plan you need to provide open access to that data. So I think that more and more, we are gonna need to learn how to prepare the data and how to document in a way that uh, it's accessible. That's uh, 
acronym for this is called FAIR, F-A-I-R. It's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, the data. So it's FAIR, F-A-I-R. And some journals, it's more, um, some people share the data because they see the benefit. They believe that sharing the data is important uh, for science, for the advancement of science, for reviewers to evaluate, to make things more transparent when you describe the methods that you have used and you have, okay, that's the data I've used, that's the methods I wrote in the material methods. You can go to this repository and you can download all the code and the data and you can reproduce easily or not so easy, depends on how, the, how it's your documentation of that data and the code. But if you look at the sessions of the journals, the data and code availability is something that is becoming more common. So for, I see a lot of our young students, a lot of the young research career uh, people here. So uh, that's something that is becoming more and more um, nowadays, it's becoming more important. So we need to start learning on how to operate in that way that we can make things more transparent and accessible. We founded, uh, I think together, I think Adam Sparks gave a seminar here for you in the last year, right? I remember that he also talked about uh, open plant pathology, which is an uh, in initiative that we founded in 2018, it's like uh, five years now, that we believe that in open, open plant pathology as an initiative to support and promote openness, transparency and reproducibility of scientific research data and methods applied to plant pathology. And when we found something like open plant pathology, we need to be the ones giving the example, right? We need to operate in that way. So that's why in my laboratory, all the research, whenever possible, we, since five years, all the papers have been gone in preprint way before the publication. So people get easy access, free access to that paper, that information. And I've been working with a computational code to make things documented and sharing the data associated with papers. So it's not something that we uh, distribute beforehand. So it's when we publish something, a paper, a research, or um, a tool, we provide the data and the methods so people can easily reproduce, understand what was done and reproduce if they want. And we wrote a, a paper, we would like to know the status of uh, openness and reproducibility in our field. We surveyed many journals from the field, general plant pathology journals, and we were looking at specifically, this is the list of journals in the field. We surveyed more than uh, 300 articles, and we were looking at uh, how researchers were, if researchers were sharing and documenting uh, appropriately the, uh, the data and the codes. And we found that only 10% of all the papers have shared the data openly. And most of them were molecular data because there are, there are repositories to store DNA data, for example. Most of the experimental data from the field experiments or greenhouse work, people are not sharing the data. Most of the papers are paywalled some of them, most of them, they do not share. Free access only 10%. Some data is behind a paywall, so you don't get easy access. And a uh, large number is the data available upon request. So you, they state that you can, okay, I can share the data if, with you if you ask me. That's a, I don't know what's a reasonable request, what's unreasonable. <laughs> But the idea is that the data is not available, but you need to ask the researchers. There are some nice papers showing that this actually does not work well, because when people ask for the, for, for the data, if it's not uh, appropriately stored, even for us researchers, if we published something five years ago, 
if we go back to our hard drive, we cannot find that data. Actually, we can find, but it's not in a way that we can share. People can understand what was done or how it was worked in that data. So the idea is that when we share the data openly, there is a documentation of that, all the variables and all the information in that data set is easy to understand and follow and when you get access to. So, or you have two different routes, or we keep the data privately, closed or open. The idea is that we need some repositories, general purpose, there are so many uh, general purposes repositories for data, they are free. You can get a DOI, uh, an, an object identifier. So we have the link for the DOI. It's a unit that can be citable. So people can find your data and cite if they use the data because you have the DOI, the DOI. Uh, and there are so many repositories. Some are specific, depending on the data that you have. Some are general purpose. If you have an experimental data, it's more a general purpose. You can use some of these Zenodo, Open Science Framework, Figshare, Dryad, and uh, some other different rep repositories to store your, your data. And you, you get the DOI for that. In experiments, when we run experiments, there are some protocols. You can develop a protocol specific for your work. You can publish that too. You can make the protocol accessible for other people uh, as well. There are some platforms and made to uh, store the protocols. And actually it's something that you need to think, is it useful only for me or is it useful for others? If that's something useful and new, you don't need a paper. So that's, you have the paper and you also have the protocol. So you have another product. So the idea is that you have different products of your research that can go to different different rep repositories to different locations and they can all be citable and count as a scientific pr production, for example. And the code, as far as the code is concerned, you have a research campaign that's the concept that you organize all the data, the code and all the materials in a research campaign, computationally speaking, it's a project or a, folder where you have organized all your information so that you, your advisor, your colleague, a postdoc working with you, a student can understand and can they can be shared. They can get easy access to that um, information. You have repositories like uh, GitHub, which is made for software, for storing software and distributing software. And you can share People can document and use that software and contribute to improve that kind of software. And also the code you can store in uh, repositories like the Open Science Framework and Zenodo and get a DOI for them. I'm gonna show you some examples that we have, we've been using. So the idea of the research companion, it's a, a container for the different elements. So we have the document, have the article, have the text, the code, the data, all packed in a single unit, organized that you can distribute. It's like you have a software and you distribute that software. The idea here is that you distribute, you can share the outcome of your research, all the units that you produce during your research for others. You have a location and that works as a single unit as well. It's a research companion for that work that is associated with the paper. For, it, for example, or not associated with the paper. It can be just a research com companion. And you can start small and then grow. The reproducibility levels that we can, uh, if we can define the levels from zero to three, you have the article only is not reproducible. Your research, if you don't share the data and correctly instruct the protocol to analyze that data, it's not reproducible, so it's level zero. The level one would be sharing the data and the protocols as a supplemental, supplemental material of an article, for example. You have a zip file, that's level one. 
A more advanced level would be level two and three, where you have the code, the data, and the protocols, you have the article, you have a preprint, which gives easy prompt access to your research paper, and you have a repository where you store that protocol, the data, and the code. And the article, the preprint, the research companion, the raw data, and everything you pack and you host that in a repository, that's the upper level of reproducibility. Anyone can just download everything and reproduce what you did in terms of computational code. When we talk about openness in terms of communication of the results and the findings, we have the abstract when we present, when we give a talk, uh, we present a poster. It's preliminary information that's going openly, it's going open to the public, to the audience. So you're opening your findings. You're not publishing yet, but you are saying, you are showing, look, I'm doing this kind of work. I've been working on that research, it's preliminary. So we set the stage and say, that's my research. It's not done yet. When you, you have a project, you need to register a project. When you ask for money, for example, you write a grant, you, you pack your idea, you have a package of your idea and you make this public. It's not public in, for the people, but for the committee that is going to evaluate. So in some fields like in medicine, um, in human diseases, for example, there are initiatives, they are requesting research, researchers to set a plan on how they need to open actually the project. They need to define everything in terms of how they will analyze that data, the number of samples, the number of units, the sampling units, they need to make this public actually. And this is a good idea actually, because you are selling your idea in advance of, of the results. You are saying that you are, you have a team to work with that research question and that's how you're gonna address uh, the research uh, that you are looking at. So in, in our field it's different because we tend to keep, keep things in secret, high secret, because we don't want other people <laughs> Uh, have the sense that they're gonna use our idea or run faster and do something faster than we than we can do. But when we present the poster, we can store actually the poster, the talk, the abstract in public repositories as as, as well. They can be part of your research companion, which is important in terms of uh, visibility of your research. The preprint, uh, the idea of the preprint is to have this submitted submission format of your paper uh, stored in a repository. And it gets the DOI, it gets it cited, it can be cited, and people can evaluate and criticize. And then you can use those comments from the com community to improve and to later submit to a journal. So it's per perfectly fine to, to post a preprint before you have your paper in a journal. So that's the idea. What doesn't happen much is get the com community feedback. That would be nice if the community can get early access to your research and you get the comments from a large panel of uh, of, of reviewers, for example, independent reviewers commenting on your work so it, you can improve it. So that doesn't happen all the time. The idea is that the preprint is the same content of your submitted. So you post the preprint before you submit and it's free access because sometimes you choose a journal, a journal that's actually not, it's paywalled. People don't get access unless they pay for that, uh, that article. So you, have, you provide an option, a free option. It's the same content. So it's important when you post a preprint, you can, it's fine to update your preprint after your paper is published. Actually, you can do that. So you have different versions of a preprint. And the most common, the Agri Archive and the Bio Archive is the most famous one. 
And the idea is that you can also use the Zenodo. It's another option. Open Science Framework preprints is the one I've been using for many years, uh, more frequently than the bio uh, archive. I like the uh, Open Science Framework actually because it connects well with the GitHub where I have the codes. So there is a connection, a natural flow between a preprint project in the Open Science Framework. It links nicely to my GitHub. So it's everything the same, same uh, platform. The BioArchive, this is an example of a paper we published in BioArchive first, and then in Phytopathology later. And we updated the, uh, the BioArchive version after we got the paper published. And in terms of visibility, you can, they can get caught by, uh, for example, the Google Scholar. Those are examples of uh, open science framework preprints that I posted so people can find if you sign an alert, Google alert in your email, for example, of a certain topic that you are following, you can get your alert, you can get alerted uh, of a preprint and not only you can wait for the final paper in the journal. So it, uh, it's interesting that it's indexed by Google Scholar very quickly, like three, four days after posting a preprint, you have people aware of your work because you posted the preprint and Google is indexing very quickly. So do you want to change and embrace reproducibility? It's not easy, I would say, I've been doing this uh, reproducible research, uh, using reproducible research practice for many years. It's more, a little more challenging. It demands more work from our end, training of students in the lab. We need to switch our philosophy in terms of uh, not only the paper is important, but all the process during our research matters. Uh, and technology is important. We need to learn new technology to help us. So the idea is that we need to use certain software because certain software softwares that we use, they don't allow reproducibility. For example, using a point and click software, I cannot reproduce, I cannot say, unless I say you click the mouse in a set of sequence of operations I need to instruct them and make that up as a protocol. If I have a code, a prompt and a code a version of that uh, algorithm, it's more, it's easy, it's my easy, it's easy to reproduce my research code in, compared to a point and click software, for example. So we have options like R language or Python or any other language that works as a code. In workflow environments that we need to learn, collaborative and sharing platforms, like how to post your code on GitHub, how to connect with the Open Science Framework. So there's a process that we need to learn and that takes time. And that's some examples of uh, my projects on the uh, Open Science Framework platform. Those are research companions associated with papers. So most of them would say almost 100% of the papers coming out from my lab, we have, you can get access to the, uh, to the data and the code. And we make this explicit in the paper in the section called data processing, availability and reproducibility. So that's how we, we make sure that we provide the access to the uh, data and the, and the codes that we developed. We can save money and use a single, what we do is use R. We are our users in our lab. And the idea is that we have an R project that connects everything. We import data from uh, spreadsheets and we conduct all the analysis that we need in the single uh, platform, in the same environment. And we export as different outcomes like the HTML tables, HTML file, PDF, document, a Word document, but we, we can work exclusively in the platform called RStudio, 
which is uh, which is nice because we we have a single platform. We don't need to rely on multiple softwares. We have one that does all the job that we we need. I'm going to show you some uh, some examples of open research and tools from my lab in terms of uh, developing tools that can be used useful. I'll uh, tell stories about how we connect uh, articles, research, and with open data and open tools. This is an, uh, an example of uh, what's most common, which is uh, pub we publish a paper. Then we provide access to the codes and all the files on GitHub here. And here's a website that describes the, the research process, the data analysis process, documented analysis. So we write in English the instruction on how we, how we analyze that data for that work. And we, we provide all the scripts and we document. That's important for us because it's a way to, to learn and also reproduce better. If you want to, um, I want to work with a student or a postdoc, we, we know what everybody is doing because we have a documentation. If it's only computer code and no documentation, it's a nightmare if we want to understand what was done, even ourselves, if we do did something in the past last year, if we don't document what we did, we spend more time to understand what was done uh, before. So we, we spend more time. The idea is that we can save time documenting, and this is also very transparent. When we publish the paper or we submit the paper, we inform the reviewers that reviewers can find everything in this repository, and there's a website where you can read all the documentation that was associated with that uh, data analysis. Here is a different uh, story. It's about uh, a paper that was uh, I published a few years ago about standard diagrams. And associated with that paper, we developed uh, a dashboard. So all the standard diagrams that were reviewed, reviewed in that paper, we provided a collection, a curated collection of all these standard diagrams that we studied in this paper and Nowadays, we are incrementing or improving this database by adding more papers. So people can just come here to this website and search for standard diagrams. So the idea is that there's a paper associated with an online database that's openly available for anyone to check the data in that paper, but also can be useful if you are working with the visual assessment of plant diseases you can go and search and navigate in this uh, website to look for a specific standard diagrams. You can search for by the crop name, for this pathogen name, and so on. That's another uh, idea that uh, we had was it started as a database, actually. Uh, I've been working with Fusarium graminearum, a pathogen that causes Fusarium head blight in wheat, barley, and other cereal crops. And we were collecting papers or getting data from researchers about the spatial location of the different species of the, of the complex. There is a complex of different species and we want to put this on a, in, a, in a map. We wanted to have a global map of the species complex. And the idea was it started as an online database and it turned out to be a paper because we had a bibliographic analysis of all the authorship analysis, all the research groups working with this pathogen. And uh, we could explore the differences in the distribution of those species across the, the globe. Uh, like some areas we could see like in China, in some Asia, we could see clusters of species clustering according to climate. So that was a, a nice story that started with a, a simple online database that I wanted to make online. It turned to be a paper published in uh, Fight Pathology. And that's the link to get access to this global database. It's a shiny, our shiny app. 
That's another story, also a paper associated with the Shiny app. It's a profitability of fungicide applications work. We did some uh, simulations uh, studies and that's, we developed an app. So uh, we could reproduce and uh, develop something that could be useful for farmers if they want to, if you have information about the disease pressure, the tenable yield, the control efficacy of the fungicides. So what's the breaking even probability? It's a tool that we developed that could be useful to uh, as a decision in the decision making process of applying fungicides. Here's another story about the development development by a student from my lab, Kaiki Alves. He developed the AP feeder, which is a package in our package. And we developed this package before and then came the paper. So we published a paper that describes, introduces the epifeter package and instruct how to run all the functions in this package to analyze disease progress curve data. So there is the, some capabilities of the package is to simulate diseases according to the models. So this function simulation lo logistic model, we add some information about the parameters and we can get the curve. So we start with the parameters to get the curve, or we can start with the disease progress curve and fit models. And uh, what the package does is uh, to show the results of the fitting of the different population dynamics models. And you can look at the statistics here and choose the best fitting model to that data. And that's also the calculation of the area under the disease progress curve. So the three uh, most important outcomes of these packages, simulation of epidemics, the model fitting, and calculation of the AUDPC. That's another interesting package that was developed by a colleague. He's not a plant pathologist. He's a breeder, actually. This uh, we call Pleman in Portuguese. I would say Pleman, <laughs> it's easier. Uh, the Pleman package is a package for analyzing plant images to count the number of seeds to measure leaf area. And there's uh, some features in this package that was specifically designed to measure disease symptoms, this, the severity of the disease. And we, we, we collaborated with uh, Thiago uh, to introduce and we published a paper actually to demonstrate how the package can be useful as an alternative to proprietary uh, expensive software that does the same thing. So we, that's how the package works. We need the image to read the image. We need some palettes, some palettes showing the healthy area. So we sample across the image and prepare a single image representing the, um, the healthy area the symptomatic area and the background. So for this case, we need a standard background. And that's what the package does. It calculates using this measured disease function, it calculates the percent area affected by the symptoms in this leaf. So it segregates the background from the leaf and the lesions from the leaf. And that's what we used. It's important to mention that we use the open data sets for several diseases and we made all the data sets available as, as, as well when we validated this, uh, this work. And for most of the diseases that we worked, we tested the Pleman package. It worked very well compared to ASSESS, which is APS proprietary software. The, the concordance was pretty good. It was very high, more than higher than 0.99 excepting one disease that was uh, xylella in uh, tobacco plants where the symptoms are not so distinct from the leaf. It's very difficult even for humans, for visual analysis, it's very complicated. So for most of the cases where we have lesions that are easily separated from the background from, from the leaf, it's, uh, it does a very good job. Some challenges, challenges here, so it's not recommended for complex background, gradients, exposition and shadows, it doesn't work well. So we need these alternatives. So it's more 
appropriate for a controlled environment uh, when you, you acquire the images, you need to have a standard background. That's a short video I'd like to show you one of the features of the uh, Plimum package. So we can interactively um, prepare the palettes by using the mouse in our studio. We can, do, I'm gonna show you. We can uh, pick the background, the leaf image and the lesions interactively using R. So we need to import the image first. We can see the, the image, image combine and measure disease iter. We go with the mouse and we click on the background first, then the green area representing the healthy area, and then the lesion area. And actually we can store those values and it prepares a an, an single image for each fraction of that uh, image. And it shows actually the, the level of disease in, in percentage. And finally, I have this uh, in terms of education, this online book in epidemiology. This is started as a notes, teaching notes from the course I've been teaching for more than, uh, more than 15 years. I was organizing my notes and I used R to prepare this book in epidemiology. It's made with R and it's actually R for plant disease epidemiology. And the idea is that there are, we can use R to help us uh, solve, to uh, help us to plot disease progress curves, to analyze the curves, to analyze this data, to calculate. There are some functions in R to calculate disease scores, uh, disease index, for example, and some chapters about the standard diagrams, temporal analysis, spatial analysis. So it's a companion to my course on epidemiology. And I'm also, uh, I've been developing a package associated with this book. So you, you're gonna in, uh, install the package that comes with the data sets and all the functions that I've developed specific for this book. So we can use actually the, uh, the book, the package associated with that book. You don't need to import data from different files. So you have the package that comes with all the, uh, the data and the, and the functions used in this book. So what's the benefits from opening sharing widely in my, in my opinion? So it's, it's becoming mandatory. It's gonna become more uh, frequent that we are gonna be required to share the data, either sponsors or journals. We are gonna need to know where to store the data and how to prepare and document the data. Work more efficiently and facilitates collaborations if we have been using platforms like GitHub or we can work with different teams. We can actually in the Open Plant Pathology Initiative, there is a good example of a package that was uh, developed as a part of a student's work. It's called the Hajis package. So by running the Open Plant Pathology Initiative, we could develop some packs that were useful for that research, but that turned into a package. We helped the student to develop a package and it, all, it became something that is being used by other people in other work. So by, it facilitates the, the collaborations. Improved reproducibility of the data and the methods as well. The visibility and transparency. I think once you start to share, there are some examples of the, the Plyman package that we validated. There was another paper citing our work because the researchers used the data. They were citing the work because they used that data. It's important so it becomes more visible, not only because the paper itself, but the data is also product and people can cite and can use and cite that, to, that work. Uh, multiple citable outcomes. So the data and the code and the, 
manuscript is important. It's not only the paper itself that counts, but uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't think people are being evaluated by the number of data sets they share, the code they share, the research companion. But uh, if you are a student and if you want to become, to make your work more visible, it's important to have a website. It's important to be visible in social media. I think there are so many benefits from starting to share your presentation to share like we are doing here, like I'm doing here. It's gonna go to YouTube. It's gonna be free access to other people can follow this as well. So uh, that's what I've what I had for this afternoon. I'm glad to answer questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. De Ponte, for this presentation and for all the knowledge. So if you have questions, uh, you can write it down in the chat or you can just um, unmute yourself. Okay, uh, Dr. Chris, you have a question? You can unmute yourself. Yes, hi Emerson again. Uh, so I have a question here, and perhaps you can help me with your thoughts. So I'm I'm hearing, for example, people who are retiring and who are willing to share their data, and sometimes they find a new faculty and then they share all that information just to, with that person. But so, so the question here is that: um, Are you aware of any possibility to you know, link whatever is already published with data that that can be shared at a later time. You know, it could be years or even decades after that publication. So, um, any thoughts about that? So, you're talking about the kind of platform that we can store. You can deposit the data associated with papers. Yeah. So, repositories are available. I am aware of that, yeah. but. So the question is more about how to link the information with things that are already published. Because in that publication, you are not going to say, okay, this information is available in these repositories, for example. Yeah, I think for you're talking about old papers, uh, I'm not sure how to get the data without contacting the authors and asking for if there is a location where they can get access to that data. because. The idea here is that every new paper, you explicitly inform where the data can be found. So there yes. is a repository and you cite in the paper and you make this explicit written in the paper where is the link to find that data associated with that paper. But sure, I but don't so know I'm... for published papers, the authors yeah. should be con contacted. Because so I, I agree with the idea of sharing information. However, we also have to consider that it may have impacts on, on uh, newer faculty members, for example, you know, people who are going through the tenure track process. And, you know, sometimes we are trying to protect information. But once you get tenure, time passes, probably people will be more open to share data. And so, so that's, that's why I, I also asked that question. So what will be the possibility? Maybe nothing is available at the moment, but perhaps start thinking about how can we link information um, from previously published uh, manuscripts with data that can be uploaded at a later time. Mm -hmm. I think there should be a direct benefit from the uh, from the sharing of this old data that people would make the effort to go back to the data and make it available. If there's if that counts for uh, getting the tenure, for example, if that's important because if there is this uh, requirement of sponsors in the U.S. I think USDA is requiring that. Uh, new projects, you need to have a data management plan. You need to inform where you're gonna store the data. So the data should be openly available. 
and uh, for your research. So I don't know how people are dealing with that. It's not only open access of the article, but also opening the data because it's a requirement from the sponsor. That's the way I think people will start to make the move from closing the data to opening the data. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So the, the thing is that not all the sponsors require that. So it's one type of sponsor, but but not all of them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I I have a question. So uh, in what moment do you actually uh, share like the bread greens? In which specific moment? In what moment I share the data you, you, you said? No, the, the preprint. Oh, the preprint. Yeah. The preprint is uh, right. Uh, actually, when I have a preprint, I have the manuscript ready for the submission. It's a, it's a submission. It's, a, it's ready. It's not a preliminary version. It's not a, something that's incomplete. It's the complete story. That's the point. Okay, it's the complete story because it's going to go public. Everybody will have access to that paper. You don't want a poor paper available. So you don't want to share something that's not ready. So the idea behind a preprint is that you give access to something that you're going to submit, ideally after you get comments, get feedback from the community, so we can improve and submit to a journal. And you can go back and update that preprint after your paper is uh, published, after you re re revise with the comments from the reviewers, you can go back and update. Thank you. Hey, does anybody else have any questions? It doesn't look like it. So Mariella, if you want to go ahead and close the seminar. Okay, sounds good. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Emerson Del Ponte. I know that right now is kind of late there in Brazil. Uh, but oh, we really appreciate your time and the knowledge, and we will be posting this recording in, in the YouTube channel. So we're going to share that also with other people that were not able to attend. So thank you okay. so much. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much for your attention. Thank you, Emerson. Thank you. Bye-bye.